a lot of it was sort of experiential. We're going to go to the store together, and when we're at the store, you're going to learn math, pricing, budgets, nutrition. Their biggest mental block when they're trying to make a decision to homeschool or not homeschool is, can I do this? I think particularly for Bitcoiners, you're, you're already you're already fighting that fight. You already mm -hmm. are trying to do something new and different. Young parents have all the tools they need by far to be able to turn their kids into productive, happy members of society. There's no sort of anti-socialization, really. There's a lot of FUD here that Bitcoiners mm -hmm. will be familiar with that you can just kind of toss out. The bar is not that high. You can definitely do this. Welcome, Brooke, to Bitcoin Homeschoolers. We're so excited you're here. And man, we got a lot that we can talk about. But most importantly, you are a veteran homeschooler. Your kids, are they both out of college now or just one? No, my son, Owen, uh, he's just turning 21. He's at UCLA. He'll be okay. a senior next year. He's pre-med there, so he's so, doing fine. Okay, so almost almost at the, well, you're basically, did you homeschool the entire way from beginning to end? No, they ended up going to traditional high school here. They went to public school here, Okay, um, but everything up until then. Gotcha. Yeah. So we can we, dig into we that a little there. bit. Yeah. Why don't we start with the background so that, yeah, let's the, do that the audience has an idea where you're coming from. Mm -hmm. And I think we should cover both. The, the homeschooling is the biggest part of that. And mm -hmm. if you want to weave Bitcoin into that, go ahead, or we can just cover it as a separate subject. But let's start with the homeschooling journey. Yeah. So basically, why did you start homeschooling? What was the circumstance? What where was your mind at? Like, what were you, what were you thinking? Well, my background, I, I, I grew up overseas, uh, bouncing around. My father was a banker. My mother is a college professor. And so Tokyo, Panama, Puerto Rico, and so forth. A lot of traveling, seeing a lot of people around the world in different circumstances. So when I, after I graduated college, I didn't really have a particular career in mind. So I bounced around through a half a dozen sort of different sectors and industries. But what they did give me is a really broad background of of working conditions in the world and how people interact and what is useful and what is not. And that really, I think, shaped what I was going to do with my kids. I didn't have them until I was in my 30s. I, I had some miles under the belt. And I think that really sort of formulated my opinion and, and how I wanted to do it. So the opportunity came along because I, I realized in 2005 and six that the housing market was going nuts. And so I put my house on the market. It wasn't a pre-plan or anything, but if they were going to give me that amount of money for my house, I was going to go ahead and sell it. Um, and so I did in 2006 and invested all the proceeds and went to Hawaii. And at that time, my son was three and my daughter was sort of just entering school age, five, six. And in Hawaii, we sort of started with her schooling. It only lasted a, a year there before we came back to California. But we kind of continued with the program when we came back. I didn't see any need. I didn't have a full-time job because of the proceeds were creating income. And so I was able to do a large part of this myself also, which was a thrill. It was the best job I've ever had, and I've had a lot. And this all kind of stemmed from the general consensus in my mind over all these years that people, people kind of learn what they want to learn. And they don't really learn things that they're not interested in. So in my mind... It wasn't a terribly high bar sort of in the elementary school level because, you know, a third or a half of the next school year is spent sort of relearning what you forgot from the last year. And there's an awful lot of time that's not really that productive, especially if you're trying to force teach people things that they're not interested in, and especially kids. So I realized that they're going to learn what interests them and the rest of it whether they learn it or not, and kind of blowing up some of these, in my mind, fallacies, like they need to have a broad education. They need to be, they need to be taught about everything. It's like, well, that's not really how adults work. Uh, in my experience, you, you get a career and you follow your interests outside of work, but everything else that you were taught kind of falls away. Uh, but you do pursue the things that interest you and you, you become good at those things. And the other, the other sort of well, we agree that you may not actually need all these things, but we're teaching you how to learn. So that's an important skill. You're learning how to learn. And, and so that only goes for a, a short time anyway, because then you learn how to learn. And, and, and yet, you know, schooling is 12 years long. So 
I didn't really buy any of these things. I just had a chat with my daughter to kind of go back over what her impression was of these years. And uh, we really see kind of eye to eye. She said, you know what, what you guys did for me is you gave me the basic tools. You taught me, you know, basic math and how to read so that then I could kind of take those in the directions that I wanted to take them. And that, that it was really important to get those basic skills down. But beyond that, um, she agreed with me that you kind of learn what you need to learn and you pursue those things. The other thing I thought was very interesting that she talked about, the we went to a home-based partnership uh, twice a week with sort of elective style classes where an expert or a specialist would come in and teach the kids something in particular. She said she really liked those because it was almost like college style and you could choose what you wanted to do and not do what you didn't want to do. Um, and that, that made a big impression on her along with the multi-age aspect of that particular homeschool partnership where the old kids are helping the young kids. And then when the young kids become the older kids, they, they know how to treat the young kids. Mm -hmm. And that interaction just, I don't think it happens in the traditional school system. So those were the two things that she really remembers well. And that's kind of what I, how I remember it also. It's like I, I taught them the basics and we knew what they were supposed to need to know. You asked about resources. Really the only one I used was that sort of, what does your kid need to know in fifth grade series of books? Just so that I was, you know, confident that we were sort of on the right track. And if they went back into traditional, they would be ahead of the game. Um, but really, we didn't use those much because we just blew right past when you're doing your own and you have your own time. You have you have so much opportunity to uh, go in different directions that it, it really wasn't even an issue. Wow. If I could uh, just ask a couple of clarifying questions along the along the way. So you were the one actually doing the teaching, right? Do I have that correct? Yes, uh, I did, and uh, their mother also oh, know, okay. did a fair amount of teaching. Okay, you were also. both kind of both in it. We were that's, both involved. That's yeah. fantastic. A lot of times. But as my daughter says, you know, we didn't actually do that much, like, actual hands-on teaching. A lot of it was sort of experiential. We're going to go to the store together, and when we're at the store, you're going to learn math, pricing, budgets, nutrition. You know, we're going to learn everything by experience. Yeah, I love it. And did you... Did you teach year round? Because I, I agree with you. When you when you take a summer off and you spend the first few weeks or a month trying to recap where you were before, where you might say that someone was in public school for some number of years, but they there there's huge blocks of times that are just trying to recap where they were before and there's a lot of a lot of waste in that from a time perspective. Did you guys go full time? Like full year? Yeah, it was it was continuous, like life. It it doesn't turn off or on, it just goes. I think that's a, a benefit. I'm just trying to keep track of this too, is, is Tali and I are talking to people like yourself and trying to boil down, not just the, how do you do this and the mindset, which is another thing I really want to ask you about, but also the benefits of doing this. And that's, uh, that's something that I know that we've talked about, Tali and I have talked about before, but I, I don't feel like we talk about it enough. When you go full time and you don't have that, that gap and you're just continuously you know, building on where you before. To me, it's it's almost like if you went to the gym and you worked out for a few months, then you stopped for a few months, and then you worked out again for a few months, and you and back and forth. Versus the person next to you, maybe they're not doing the most intense thing, but they stay on the same consistent path for a long time. The compounding effects are they get much further ahead. And if you do that with studying, if you do that with your diet, you do that with your relationships, you can. It's just amazing, and I think that that is um, that's one of the, the overlooked aspects of yeah. the, taking control of, the, of your education. And I'll, and I'll make a, another small analogy to that, if I may, because I think we all learned a lot in the last five years to, as adults, and that was one of my sort of basic thing is like never treat your kids like they're little kids that don't know what's going on. They, you know, treat them like they're adults. And my daughter kind of echoed that. She liked the college style classes that she could select when she was seven you know so the point i was going to make i think that echoes you is that we all found out about that as adults when we were forced to work at home during the pandemic all of a sudden when you're not on this sort of industrial clock where you clock into work and you work for eight hours and then you go home and you're exhausted and the only thing you're going to do is flip on the tube and and vacate your mind and then you're going to sleep and then you're going to go back and do it all over again 
when you're at home or you're in control of your schedule and you're working for yourself, I think, I think a lot of people found that, well, actually, my style likes to kind of do a little bit of work now and then take a little break and then do a little bit of this and the types of things you can't do in the workplace. Really, I know that my productivity, I was a realtor, so I was sort of in control of my own schedule at the time. But I think for a lot of people, control of your own schedule makes a huge difference to your learning and your productivity, your efficiency. And it speaks to what you're saying about that sort of on, off, on, off mandated. Yep. Uh, wow. There's so many, so many things. <laughs> Can I just um, interject? Yeah, I want to, I want to just go back to your, when you first started your mindset, because a, a lot of Bitcoiners that we've spoken to, their biggest mental block, I think, when they're trying to make a decision to homeschool or not homeschool is, can I do this? Am I going to ruin my kids? Am I going to get to the point where I want to kill them because I cannot stand them? You know, that kind of fear. And I just want to go back to something you said before, which is when the kids are young, the you don't have to set the bar so high. It's just letting them experience life with you. So the example you gave was the, the grocery trip. And I just remember specifically when our kids were really young and I knew nothing about homeschooling, I read somewhere that I should give them a job when we go to the grocery store. Because what you see is parents would hand them an iPad and they're watching movies and the mom's doing the grocery store and they just want to be in and out as quickly as possible before the child sees something they want to buy and then throws a fit, right? That's like sort of the mentality. But if you involve them suddenly, you're not just trying to occupy them. You're saying, well, we have these three cereal choices. Which one should we get? And you get the box off the shelf. And now write down how much that costs. And at the end of the grocery shopping, they add up the cost. And, you know, like get them involved and let them, like you were saying, don't treat them like they are they can't understand. Treat them like adults and explain it to them so they have a chance to be a part of that. And that's homeschooling already when it's in the beginning stages. Yep. There's also a funny uh, side note to that helping me shop kind of thing, which is very good for the mental thing. It also is a very handy way to burn off that extra kid energy. Look, you got to carry that sack of flour around while we shop. I'm sorry. <laughs> Just, yeah. okay. Very good for burning <laughs> off extra energy. And they're involved. They, you would be surprised. They, they, they want to. <laughs> They do. And, you know, you go to Whole Foods and they have those little tiny shopping carts that you push around. They go shopper, shop, future shopper in training or something. I'm like, you can, if you don't, if you go to a store and they don't have those and they just have those like truck carts, you know, the really giant mm. truck carts and stuff, you can still get them to walk in and out of there and pick up stuff and, you know, help you a little bit. basket. Absolutely. Exactly. Yeah. Or send them off on an errand. Hey, especially if they have an older sibling. Hey, you need to go find this aisle and get this item. And then they're, mm -hmm, you, mm -hmm. you, you make sure that they're not, you can kind of keep an so eye on them. So you can but... teach them reading by showing them just big words, mm -hmm. labels to look for. You can yeah. teach them mental math. If you know, you right. just round up the dollars and there's so right. many things they can learn just in a shopping trip. Absolutely. And, and uh, you know, decision-making, they're going to be 10 brands. Uh, look at the nutritional guide. Don't pick the one that's got 57% fat. Uh, you know, and look at the different pricing. Yeah, you're, you're right. It, it just never ends the amount of learning you can do just in a store. Mm -hmm. Well, even back up before that, you could say, let's go to the, the kitchen guys and let's let's figure out what we're going to cook, right? We're going to make mom her birthday, her birthday special meal. Let's go find the recipe. What do we need? And have them even develop the list before you go to the store, right? I mean, there's now they're learning how to it's not just how to cook. I mean, in that case, they're they're thinking about what goes into food. This is where the food comes. It's not just something that mom slaps a plate down and it's it's magic. It's 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 there. There's learning in everything you do. Every chore, as small as making a grocery list, can mm -hmm. can add. Uh, My daughter, like as she was saying, what uh, she notices in her cohort as young twenty somethings is that um, yeah, they don't. They don't necessarily know how to cook. She said exactly what you did, like starting with a recipe, going to the store, purchasing these items, sticking to your budget and and being able to carry out that exercise. I mean, that that's actually a lot more useful in the working worlds that I in which I participated, like basic, you know, you have a project. It has certain target goals. It has a budget. You know, you, you need to you turn in your work product in whatever sector, whatever industry, very much like a recipe. We, at one point, we had seven dogs in the house at the same time we had 
the, the Talia had the four kids trying to get them to activities, the meals, the schooling, and there was always something something going on. Well, that's also one of the benefits of homeschooling. I think, you know, you got to learn to roll with the punches, the unexpected things. A part of what the system does, it tries to homogenize everything and make it all level playing field and make everything sort of fit in a box. And so that ability to think on your feet and come up with solutions and, and solve the type of everyday problems that are, uh, you know, that come up they every come, day. They, they do come uh, up. And the pets, I know things don't always go well when you have pets, right? And... It's great when a puppy is new and fun and cuddly and everything else, but Tali, she thought it would be a good experience for the kids, and she thought it would be fun to have a lot of puppies, so she she got two standard poodles and said, we'll let them breed, and we'll, you know. And so the kids, at one point, they got to see the puppies being being born. Like I'd never seen that either growing up, and that's a lot different than seeing something on the Nature Channel versus then it's at your own, your own house. And then one of the litter died and so now you're talking to little kids about other subjects too yep and again it's not the same as it's not the same as just watching things on tv i get it things on the internet really powerful you you can learn a lot through the internet there's it's, it's amazing what this technology is but there's something different when your kid is holding like a little animal that just passed away it's didn't make yep. it with the litter Whatever it is, if you don't want to traumatize them, certainly that would be horrible. But on the other hand, there's a lot about life. And Absolutely. when you as a parent are there to talk to them how to deal with that, then you're helping them deal with things in the future that when you're not going to be there. And I, and I really feel for those, those kids today that don't have someone to help as a coach guide them through, yeah, this is a difficult time. This is... You know, let's we're gonna get through it together. Like whatever it is that you're gonna coach them on, on that, there's something there to help them. Um, yep. So well, and pets, pets teach us so much. I, I always had pets with my kids around, and they enjoyed the variety of, you know, menagerie. Yeah. Friends, and they do like everything from life and death, literally, to nurturing and caring and maintenance and 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 feeding and them and all that stuff. Very, yeah, right. Pets are yeah. very grounding. It is, right? And then you, you split up the chores and who's going to clean up the mess and uh, it, it just never stops. There's just a lot, of, a lot of things there. So let me ask you, when you and your wife were, were talking about doing this, were you guys already on board together? Did you guys decide this together? Or was there like some discussion back and forth? Hey, we're thinking about doing this. I mean, I, for, for us, Tali was the one who said, I want to do this. And I just said, sure. I didn't really know. I didn't even know what I was signing up for at the time. And I'm very grateful for that, but I can't claim that I had some great insight then. What was it like for you guys? My children's mother is my first wife, and I've since remarried. We were married for 25 years, and 10 of them before the kids came along. We very much saw eye to eye. We were both a little bit sort of out of the box, although we sort of would appear to be very traditional kind of upbringings, except for my overseas in terms of schooling and, and family, but we each had a sort of a streak of that unconventional or yeah, prove so it to me. Like, yeah. Well, I, good. I, I, I gotta see that's important. So, I, so I, to answer your question directly. Yeah. We kind of, there wasn't, there wasn't much discussion. It was like, yeah, this is, this is what we're going to do. We can, we have the resources, we have the capacity, but we're going to do this. Yeah. That's great. Tali and I, I, I basically said, yeah, let's do this as long as we can. And later on I, I saw the light. A lot of a lot of couples are in different positions, and there's single parents as well that would like to do things like the what we're talking about with the homeschooling. And everybody has their own circumstances, so I think that's just fantastic. If you guys, first of all, you could do it together, and, and you did it. Secondly, you you were in sync with the direction that you were trying to go, and I that's pretty that's pretty awesome. What well, did, and there's a tie-in here just to uh, interject one last thought. There's a tie-in here with the, the bitcoining because. Um, when we talk about being willing to experiment outside of the system, being willing to sort of maybe take some criticism that you're not doing it the way that we should be doing it, that you should be doing it, all of these kind of that ability to kind of step outside the box. I think particularly for Bitcoiners, you're, you're already you're already fighting that fight. You already mm -hmm. are trying to do something new and different. And so, That's you know, interesting. you are learning how to ignore most of the criticism because it's really unfounded. 
and what you hear back from the system and the schools and the teachers and the other parents. Uh, make up your own mind. Make up your own mind. I love that. One of the things that, that you mentioned, though, the next step for us after we, Tali and I were in agreement was we were going to tell our parents and our families what we were doing. And of course, we'll tell our, you know, our peers, our friends, but our, our parents didn't understand on either side. And I'm also thinking that you said, if I understood your timeline correctly, you came back to California when the kids were still pretty young. And in my mind, it's maybe not as hostile as Germany is where they just outright ban it, but it's not exactly a pro homeschooling independent thought type of state. In my mind, I could be wrong and I don't want to generalize all people in California. That's my image though. And I'm curious, what was your experience? I'm just curious, what was the environment like? It's great that you guys were saying, yeah, we're willing to try this. We're willing to step out. We want to prove it. We want to do this. But then it's another thing when you're dealing with bureaucrats or you're dealing with others that, uh, other people who may not agree with you and and what you're doing. So if you could just, what was the environment like where you were? You said you found the the equivalent of like a co-op group, this partnership group. That's fantastic. That is huge to have that support. So what was it like? What was, what was going on in the environment at the time? Has it changed? Are you aware of any changes since then? Um, I can't speak too well to the environment at the time because both my wife at the time and I are, are sort of very independent, not, not living close to family. So the parents, you know, their opinions for neither of us really meant a whole lot for quite some time because we'd both been very independent and on our own. We'd been married for 10 years. We'd been living our own lives. Mm-hmm. And uh, really the only question is, what do I have to do to make this happen? And so we found out as long as you sort of register with the Department of Education or whoever it was at the time that you're going to homeschool your kids, that's that. Um, And as far as I was concerned, like, you know, America was founded on homeschooling, like Abe Lincoln. How can you possibly be pioneers and, and, and have school, you know, traditional schools that doesn't, (laughs) that doesn't cut it. So like, that's our heritage. (laughs) It is. Um, It is. That's so true. This idea that you need the state or somebody else to tell you and certify you that something is good or not good, I completely agree with you. And I, I think it's, it's wonderful that you, you saw that. A lot of our audience is younger Bitcoiners. Like maybe they're just starting a family or they're thinking about starting a family. And I'm thinking, what, what would they, how would they react to hearing this story about what you, you went through? And there, there's a lot of perceived risk. There's a lot of FUD about homeschooling that's, that's, that's out there. So from a mindset standpoint, did you guys ever have doubts? How did you guys work on your mindset, like your mindset going into this? And then it's not, it's not like you decide one day and then you're done. Like different, there's different highs and lows as you, as you, as you kind of go. So If you can comment on the beginning of your journey, your mindset, and maybe how did your mindset change as you as you went through the homeschooling journey? Well, I think we were very fortunate because we found this uh, home based partnership, which is the group that I mentioned before, and they they operated out of out of church facility. But it basically was people in our community who had made the decision that they wanted to homeschool their children also. Um, And it was uh, sort of three days a week. Uh, you actually only attended on two days. One day was sort of free time the whole time, and the other day were these electives that you could have a you could participate with a specialist at some skill or not. But we were just so fortunate to find this group, and I think that really was our source of strength. and And I think they are all over the place. It's a matter of sort of seeking out those like minded individuals. Interestingly, a lot of people in this group. Uh, shared some sort of vision or ideology or attitude, like you were saying, uh, that independent thought and independent study is not a bad thing. A lot of them had international connections, had traveled overseas or uh, grown up overseas or spent some time there. And so they weren't as wedded to the whole sort of systemic pressure thing. But my daughter mentioned this also when I just chatted to her, that that, that was really big for her too. And one of these FUD subjects is you know socializing how are they going to be socialized and all that well 
we ha we had a really super nice group and it was multi-age so it was like k to eight it was a small school there were maybe 40 or 50 kids all together split out into these days they made very good friends of all different ages um and the group was very supportive of this and had a couple of really nice teachers i mean we're talking all of like three teachers you know a director and a couple of a couple of teachers who were really dedicated to it and that made really all the difference for me now i being as independent minded as i am i would have continued anyway because I, I don't if somebody starts to push me then then it makes me want to succeed on my own even more but not everybody is that way and the way my daughter describes it now in hindsight was that that was a really meaningful group for her and i'm glad she sees it that way because they, they really were terrific and i think they're they're in almost every community you just have to sort of seek them out right so there's a, a couple things here so one one thing i hear you saying is look if, if if one of these young couples or young families was here listen you you can do this you have so many first of all people have been doing it for centuries eons however however long that your point earlier about it's it's not like this is really a new concept it's it's new to this generation and the last couple of generations but it's not a new new concept the second thing is there are so many resources that you can go out and and seek out in the same way that a, a, if you're a bitcoiner and you go find a meetup if you're a homeschooler and you go find a, a, a partnership group like you described there are a lot of support groups there are legal support groups there are curriculum support groups there are just just local support groups where you can actually build some friendships so what i hear you saying is listen if you if you could give advice to those folks you're saying listen you could do this absolutely you, you have all the skills you need absolutely and you have a whole a whole set of resources that, that and support that is available to you if you just ask or just seek it out. It's it's there. Absolutely, and and sadly, the bar is set far far lower than you might expect. What the kids who go through the traditional program actually achieve is is not that difficult. And and these young parents, even with just you know high school education, they have all the tools they need by far to be able to turn their kids into productive, happy members of society, there's no sort of anti-socialization really. There's a lot of FUD here that Bitcoiners mm -hmm. will be familiar with that you can just kind of toss out. The bar is not that high. You can definitely do this. There's no, no question. And the other, the other sort of side point to this is when we had this partnership school, not everybody was of exactly the same mind about homeschooling. Um, you know, there's just like Bitcoiners, there's a range. Well, it's a store of value. No, it's a medium of exchange. No, it's a transnational payment system. Like, it doesn't matter. You can support any one of these uses. Um, and, and that's a little bit, I think, with the home-based uh, schooling also, is that your ideology or your reasons are fine. They're yours. And we can all kind of share in the resources and in the making it happen for our kids and help each other succeed, irrespective of what our, mm -hmm. our ideology or final goal might be. Yeah. Let me, let me ask you a question. One of the things I like to hear from people is... When you when you hear about their vulnerabilities, they're like they made a mistake because I think it's there's a an unrealistic. This is my opinion. There's an unrealistic expectation that you have to be perfect, and that if you if you're not perfect, you're going to somehow damage your kids, right? There's this big thing. My opinion is kids are incredibly resilient, and part of this this journey is that you're learning as 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 well, and you're going to make mistakes, but you you learn from your mistakes, and then you own them. You don't try to, <clears throat> don't try to lie to your kid. They're going to figure it out. Like you could say, no, no, no. I was, you know, like I was really perfect. I meant to do that. Like it's, um, can you, would you be open to sharing maybe a, a time or a story, an anecdote of when things didn't go quite as you planned and it was kind of embarrassing and then how you learn from that. And, and, and where I'm going with this is one, it's, it's interesting to hear other people's stories. And two, I think it's reassuring to people who are starting this out again, going back to the mental game, you don't have to be perfect. You're going to go out. You're going to take a swing. Sometimes you're going to hit. Sometimes you're not. It's okay. You learn. So, To be honest, I kind of struggle. My kids were really open to this the whole time, too. And because we didn't have like tremendous pressure from family or other places, we, we pretty much uh, evolved in a supportive environment. 
So I don't know that I have any really good sort of backstories about things that came up that were particularly challenging. I did a lot of coaching over those years. And so that was probably the one time my vision of coaching young kids was that everybody plays. Everybody plays the same amount. It's not about winning. It's about developing your skills. That was probably the biggest friction point with other parents who I found to be very, very competitive, even for like six-year-olds playing basketball at the Y. It's like they're six. They're shooting at a six-foot rim. They can't dribble the ball. Like, <laughs> And I refereed also. And there's an a lot of pressure from the other parents to be sort of winners. And it's like the kid is seven. He's learning to dribble. Like he doesn't need to win this game. Nobody's going to remember this. So let's work on becoming a better dribbler. How about how about that? And not worry about, you know, what the scoreboard is. So that was probably the biggest source of friction for me with um, people in the regular system. But but the backup one spot uh, about damaging your children, it's like there's an immediacy bias here. If you look at, you know, civilization and mankind, holy cow, how did we get here? What were kids treated like? 200 years ago, 100 years ago, 50 years ago, even. I mean, we're here, we're doing okay, and life is so much better. We are really concerned about how our children progress and, and the people that they turn into. And that, that's not always the case. You know, my father really hasn't been a part of my life pretty much at all. Uh, he had his career and he did his thing. And a part of what drives me to succeed is, is maybe, you know, sort of. And a part of what drove me to homeschool was to sort of right right wrongs in the past, as, as we oh, often that do. That is a whole subject there to open up. <laughs> so that is, I mean, I, one, one of the people that we've talked about this privately with, and at some point we'll get him on the show, is Seb Bunny, and talking about that parent-child bond. And I know Tali has commented on multiple shows, like when she first held our our eldest after she was born, she's like, I don't want anybody else. Like this, she's <laughs> mine. Like this, she's not calling somebody else mom or whatever else. There, that is a, like that is real. Like when you when you feel that and you want to keep that bond, and the kids, they're they're human too. They want that bond. It goes both. It goes. Well, goes I both think ways. I think there's a fallacy that we have all sort of bought into, which is that kids have to learn independence by you leaving them alone. And so, um, for let example, them cry it out, right? let them cry it out. So they learn to self soothe that kind of thing. And my dad, even like my mom would tell stories about my dad. He's, he's older. And so he grew up with the Dr. Spock kind of philosophy. And in his mind, if you held the child when it's crying, you were spoiling the child, you are making the child weak. And so to, in his love for us, he would not soothe us and not comfort us. And so when I talked to my kids about it, well, like when we fell down, we picked ourselves up and maybe we washed the, the cut, maybe not. You just kind of slap some ointment on it and you were on your way to something else. There was no like that kind of bonding at all. And I do feel like that's a fallacy because I, to this day, from the beginning, when we had our first child, I didn't, I started to question that. I like children don't need to self-soothe. They will self-soothe when they're ready. And it's a very natural development in human growth. You know, you don't have to force them to self-soothe because all you're teaching them is really just hopelessness that they're not coming. You know, right. it's not that they've learned to self-soothe. It's that they have given up. That's different. So, yeah, no, I couldn't agree with you more. And, and, and for that reason, I think in my own personal history, uh, my decision and waiting into my 30s to have children my decision was that more I was going to be sort of the attachment parent and they slept in our bed until they reached the age where they they felt comfortable with their own. And, and mm -hmm. mine is always my attitude is always like offer support <laughs> and, you know, they'll walk away on their own. You don't have to walk, worry about them walking away when they're ready. They will believe me. But until then, your job is to support, support, support and offer right. and offer and offer. Right. Exactly. I love the relationship thing. I, I know that our kids, we would have, our, we, all of ours were pretty, it was a pretty tight shot group. I, I, all four kids within basically a little over five years. So it was, you, you could wake up in the morning in some kind of contorted positions, depending on how many had crawled into bed at night. And you're like, 
like I didn't even, like you had to be careful rolling over. You didn't know if a, a, a kid was upset and they were going to crawl into your into your bed. Um, I, I have a lot of passion about the similarities between Bitcoiners and homeschoolers. Like I think these like it's just there's just so much there. Would you share your background on the timing of when you got into Bitcoin? Sure. Well, my Bitcoin story starts a little bit late because I was busy at home with my kids. So the outside world and the news didn't really penetrate my uh, hive for quite a while. So I really heard about it for the first time in 2018 when I read a book that mentioned it. Which and book? Do you remember like, what book? Do you remember? Uh... Uh, yeah, it was uh, the real oddball guy because uh, I like oddballs. <laughs> uh, James Altucher is his name. He's a strange, strange man. I but, don't think I've uh, read anything by him. That's interesting. Okay. Yeah, he's kind of one of these uh, kind of pseudo Wall Street quants with the massive curly <laughs> hair, glasses, right. and, and the right. ideas. And, okay. Yeah. I'm picturing so, like I'm picturing like Back to the Future kind of scientist. Yeah. But yeah, but a Wall Street kind of, uh, Wall Street version of that. <laughs> yeah, kind of like that crazy professor and and i'm still not really sure whether i agree with more than about 40 percent of what he says but you know there were a couple things out of his book that were like that that kind of makes that kind of makes sense and so like many bitcoiners i read about it for the first time i was like hmm, that's interesting i bought a little very little bit i bought a I opened a coinbase account bought a little bit and promptly like let it go because life is busy and it, then two years later we got locked down and I hadn't really paid any attention to, you know, the crash, the up, the down, whatever. I, I, I had a little teeny account somewhere that I wasn't paying attention to. When we got locked down, I, I decided to haul out and I read the white paper. And the moment I read the white paper, you know, for some people, it's, it's super meaningful for others. But for me, it, it was like, wow, that is really, really cool. And then I read a book by Jake Ryan was the first book it was something like crypto assets in a digital age or something along those lines i i started reading like crazy we were locked down i had nothing else to do and really got into it then to the degree that my wife has been a portfolio manager for 25 years my wife now not my kid's mom but she worked for some of the big bigger houses and so she is entirely traditional finance and i was able to orange pill her in a matter of a day or two because really? she just wow. also was well <laughs> that 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 makes sense that's like, impressive orange pilling like most people take a like many 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 instances of repeated exposure no she's uh she's really smart her mother was a, a merrill lynch stockbroker in the 70s as a woman so you know that was mm. that was impressive in its own and she inherited and her dad's a rocket scientist so <laughs> you know, she had that. She had the horsepower, yeah. and uh, and the experience in the traditional markets to for it to click for her right away. So, I've been completely enthralled ever since. Fell down the rabbit hole. I was a realtor, but I, I've since sort of let that go and retired. And I've, like I said, I read every day. I've been studying. I founded a five hundred one c three a nonprofit to teach. So really? every week I give Bitcoin lessons. I've got. That iteration is, after iteration of my deck on a on PowerPoint. That's fantastic. Uh, okay. So is that is that's that, really my focus now is to teach, and so. So where are you teaching? Like, are you going into high schools? Are you going to colleges? Are you going to churches? Where where are you meetup groups? I started a meetup group here in Santa Barbara. It's uh, slow. We have a tough time in the U.S. in general with Bitcoin because we've got you know the full institutional presence here. And so, you know, what do you mean my Venmo doesn't settle final settlement for 60 to 90 days? You just got it. And it's hard for most people to understand. And we're not taught anything about our financial system. So a lot of my education, like for many Bitcoiners who was actually learning about money, you know, the breed love and the sailor and, and learning how the system actually works right. to understand better what this alternative system might mean. I'm not a very good self-promoter marketer type. And right now, what I do along with this meetup group is I go out every Saturday and I put a sign out in Montecito, which is a sort of a higher net worth area here. Area here, I put my sign out, walk-ins welcome, and I do my lecture whether I have nobody there and I just practice and work on my deck or I have 
got a few people that come in and I and I teach them about it. And it's all been on my own nickel because I can. And that's beautiful. So. Is this something that you? Is this something that like for from this show, for example, can we put a link to uh, your website or tell everybody what the name is, or is it something you'd prefer to keep private and just do on your own? No, 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 that's fine. I've been working on my website, so I'm not, I think all the links work now. I, I did actually record sort of 10 very amateurish lessons on Bitcoin, just myself in my living room, which I posted on a YouTube. The, the 501c3, the nonprofit's called the Santa Barbara Blockchain Institute, and it's at sbblockchain.org. But like everything I'm doing is sort of on my own and I've got a, a fellow Bitcoiner who's helping me with the website. So I'm not sure all the links are up and running, but you know, that's a work in progress. But I, I love to do the in-person teaching. And to me, the in-person gives you the opportunity to really look at your um, lecturees in the eye and you can see right away, they get something they don't, they can ask a question immediately. I do a lot of YouTube learning myself, but it's mm -hmm. just not the same you know, having somebody mm -hmm. sit there that you can just learn from so well good for you that's fantastic i do know there's others that are trying to there's a, a veteran named gabe lord that i'm trying to help he's he has founded a he's in the beginning process of the 501c3 for something called operation bitcoin to basically bring that education about money and bitcoin to to the military and that i think that's just this is like proof of work right you're the or the right. if you've it sounds like you probably read them but if you read like the the Jeff Booth types of works that are out there, you'll say, oh yeah, be the future that you want to be or make the future that you want to be. And what you're describing to me is, yeah, I, I believe in this and I'm going to go make it happen. And you're just out there doing it. And so that to me is like proof of work. And I think it's fantastic. And hopefully- Well, and it ties in with the whole homeschooling thing is that people learn what they want to learn. So I'm not into sort of like pushing and pushing people and trying to tell them, you know, if you don't do this, then blah, 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 because that's how the system works. And that's not how I think people appreciate it. So mine is more like, if you're interested, if you want to learn, come to me, I'll put out a sign up here every week. I do it rain or shine. You know, I'll, I'll teach anybody for any reason. Um, because mm. it's just about the education. I don't have any sponsors. I'm not in it for the money. I don't want to create some big organization, but I do want to teach people about it. So come find me when you're interested and I'll tell you everything I've learned. So have you gone to the the home based partnership that you were part of before and offered to teach there? I haven't yet. Unfortunately they, they sadly they lost one of their instructors kind of recently and she was a really big part of their organization. Mm. So I think they're mm. kind of getting themselves reset and for the most part my deck is geared a little bit more sort of the, the teenage years got it um yeah. so junior high high school and that's beyond this one only went to eighth grade so it's a little bit beyond sort of the little little kid version but i would love to do that too that that sort of segues a little bit into money camp which is the other thing that i did for my kids yeah let's talk about it let's let's go sure so as a part of the staying away from the regular schools and just homeschooling, I, I did kind of keep up with, okay, this is what they're supposed to know. This is what school's teaching them. And so just to try to keep them on a rough par in case they do decide at some point, I want to go to college. I want to go to high school. I want whatever, then fine. You're, you're, you're ahead of the game. And I came to realize that the schools, they don't teach anything financial pretty much at all. In 2006, when I was looking into it, there were three states in the nation that had any sort of financial literacy requirement to graduate high school. And these states were like North Dakota and Tennessee and, and some, I mean, you know, kudos to them, but they weren't very big population states either. And so I was just floored. In California, there was a technology requirement. You had to like know how to operate a computer to graduate high school. Of course, you didn't have to, you didn't know how to go buy one or how to you know finance it or like any any part of the money, but you did not need to know how to use a computer. So I saw that as completely backwards, and this gave me the idea of founding Money Camp because I just wanted to teach my kids about the basics of finance and I love it. Um, yeah, financial you know wisdom, and so what I created was about like a three hour experience for them and their friends. And I put about 50 or 60 kids through it, through all of their connections at the time. 
And it really was just a series of games because you know, back to my core principles, people learn what they want to learn and they're not going to learn stuff that that's not interesting or they don't want to or don't see the reason to. So I just created like six or seven games to help them understand, you know, why is it that we need a medium of exchange? Mm -hmm. uh, well, because if you're trying to trade back and forth with stuff and I created little, you know, uh, vegetables and fruit. Like if you try to make a meal out of the stuff that you have in hand, it's really hard to solve the double coincidence of wants. Yeah, yeah. So can you can you give an example? I, I, this is fantastic. I love this. I just love this subject. So can you give an example of one of these games? What I hear you describing uh, is an in classroom or wherever you're at for a co op, but a, an in person type of experience. Uh, How many kids are you talking about? Get, maybe give an example of, you can take that one or another one, of what one of these experiential games was. Great For example, learning. I might have done it like, maybe I did it like six times with, I don't know, six to eight kids each time. So 50, 60 kids all together, something like that. Um, mostly the homeschooling community, but a few of their friends and so forth. And so, yeah, we would get all together. And then I actually used the game of life to have them create avatars for the afternoon. So... They each got a, a, a profession and they also got an income card. And because they were drawing these randomly, you know, you could have a very well paid janitor and a very poor, whatever we would normally see as a rich person card. So I, that just gave them avatars and it, and, it, and it started the whole session off with sort of, this is going to be fun. You're going to like this. I think the one that was most interesting for sort of the high schoolers or anybody, I mean, the kids loved it was. I wanted to explain investing. And so this is sort of towards the end of the afternoon when we've kind of covered medium of exchange and stores of value and sort of these other basic ideas of money and budgeting and the time value of money, like how good it is to save. And so we get to the end of the session and I wanted to try to explain investing a little bit. And so I used jelly beans and I said, let's, so we've got these eight different colors of jelly beans. And these different colors represent different companies, right? So if you're expecting, you know, these companies to grow over time, your jelly beans are going to, to change. And this is how we'll do it. You, Every kid gets to pick 10 different jelly beans. You can pick whatever color you want, right? Some of you might pick a rainbow of color. Some of you might bet all on red. This is kind of like investing. You're going to put all your money into one or you're going to choose a bunch of different flavors. So... Right now, all the jelly beans are worth one jelly bean. And once all of your kids have picked your beans and you have them in your little cups, what I'm going to do is I'm going to fast forward you into the future 10 years. And I'm going to tell you what happened to these companies. So on one side of the board, we see each, each color has a value of one. 10 years from now, it turns out that the yellow company did super well. So their one jelly bean turned into 10 jelly beans. On the other hand, the red company blew it their ceo ran off with all their money and it's mm -hmm. worth zero so i want you to look at the jelly beans that you have in your cup now whatever colors they were <clears throat> and we're going to reset them to the new values so anybody who had who had yellow okay you get nine more yellow jelly beans who had the red sorry give them all back and so now you can see we've reset over time the value of the mm -hmm. jelly beans and so the jelly beans, your cup is like a mutual fund in a way. So we're an ETF these days. So it's your collection of investments. And you can see how some of them did well and some of them did terribly. Those of you who bet all on yellow, I mean, you made out like bandits. So it's possible to do really, really well. It's also possible to lose it all if you bet on the wrong company. So diversification is kind of a smart thing to do in, in the world here where mm -hmm. if you put all your eggs in one basket, you've got a lot of risk. And just to try to show these basic concepts of risk and reward and diversification in a way that uh, was very meaningful and immediate to children. Um, I love it. I mean, teens. Have and you? So, yeah. yeah, keep going. So I, I love this. This is fantastic. Do you, in that three hours, do you get to Bitcoin? Do you do you introduce that type of the concept? Well, I was doing this in uh, two thousand eight, nine, ten, or something oh, like that. Oh, okay. So All right. And I didn't know about it at the time. So mm. I would now I'm, I'm considering redoing money camp because I've been in touch with a few people locally here and they're very interested in it because we still have no 
financial mm -hmm. education for the kids. And so Bitcoin would certainly be like my final game there. Mm -hmm. uh, Interesting. Yeah. My head's just spinning with things to, to ask you about or tell you about. There's a lot of homeschooling conventions. The one that we've gone to is part of a, a group called Great Homeschooling Convent, GHC. They have one in California every year, and I just don't remember which city it, it is. But there are, are there others out there? There are others out there, and it would be, if when you, when you maybe do that next money camp with the Bitcoin, we should probably touch base. I know Tali and I are very passionate about it. In a month, we're going to go back to a homeschooling conference. That'll be the, the only one we plan to go to this year anyway. Last year was frustrating trying to teach Bitcoin to homeschoolers. We're going to keep on doing it. We're going to keep on pushing. We're going to keep on pushing this way. But I think what you're describing can be a huge positive impact for for anybody. You don't even have to be a homeschooler. That What you're describing is just, if you're just a parent and you're, you either choose to go to public school or you have to because of financial reasons, you, you can't homeschool. It doesn't mean that you can't do a money boot camp, right? right. And you can't do what you just described. So... Right. That is that's is fantastic. How did the kids react to? Oh, they loved it. Yeah, they they had a lot of fun. And again, it was really concentrating on make it fun. If it's not mm. fun, nobody's going home with anything. So yeah. they got to enjoy it, and it's got to come from their perspective. Now, I don't want to treat them like children. I want to treat them like adults, but I want it to be fun and fun at their level. So. You know, jelly beans are fun. I don't care if you're eight uh, or eighty. I, we we had jelly beans. We used it with a game called Cash Flow for Kids. I don't know if you ever played Kiyosaki's Cash Flow 101. It's good for teaching how financial statements work together. And he has a kids version. And so when we first introduced it, we used jelly beans to help because that way when they in that game you have you have your liabilities and your assets. And if it was a, if it was something good, we said, Okay, it's a jelly bean, you get to like we wanted to associate that with something uh, you know, for them. So I agree. What what have you done? Continuing the money thing. I mean, okay, your your kids are older now, but are you talking to them about Bitcoin? Are you are you like the crazy like Tali and I like our kids kind of tolerate us right now? You know, they're kind of you know the different stages of where they're at. But I, it's it's not necessarily easy, even if you're passionate about it, to get that point across to your kids. Sometimes it matters like what state of mind they're in. It matters who they listen to. There's a lot of things that can, can impact that. What is your experience like today bringing these two things together? Because if you're passionate about Bitcoin, you're still going to be passionate about your kids forever, right? Regardless of whether they're done with high school or not. Where, where, are, you, where are you with your kids on teaching them about Bitcoin? Well, I, I would like to think that they respect me for the things that I have passed on to them. And so in that sense, I think that anything that interests me is clearly Bitcoin does. They're, they've got in their mind like, okay, there's probably something there. But one of them is a pre-med student, 20 years old at UCLA with <laughs> uh, two other jobs on the side, tracking around doctors. And so his world is just 24-7. Uh, and he's very serious minded also. So he's not goofing off, but he's just got so much on his own plate. I mm -hmm. think he's like, it's interesting, maybe someday. And my daughter is similarly, I think, yeah, it's obvious that I've been taken by it. And so there's probably something there, but I'm also working on starting my own career right now. So my glass is full kind of, and I'll maybe get to it. I actually wrote a book. Also, and I've given them copies of my book. Yeah, let's let's get let's promote this stuff. Yeah. And so they've got copies of my book. I don't know okay. if that's reversed on your screen. No, I can I can read it for the audience because this is going to be this is an audio only. It's called Why Bitcoin. We'll have a, a link to to this in the in the show notes for everyone. So real quick, give a summary of what's the the. It's obviously about Bitcoin. It says Why Bitcoin it has a very very nice uh, image on front. What's how you structure the book and where can they where can people buy it? It's on Amazon, and there there are a couple of uh, why Bitcoin books uh, with a question mark, um, which I find great. You know, like we're all on it together. I don't care how many books they're that are titled Why Bitcoin because mm -hmm. there are so many reasons for Bitcoin that everybody can write a book. Um, my name Brooke Williams is how you would identify it. It is on Amazon. You can order it on Amazon, the paperback or uh, the audio book. I just self published it. 
really this was just a work of passion on my own part because after I got through doing all of this reading, what I tried to do is sort of distill down. So it's 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 140 pages long. It's not terribly long, and it's written in as a conversationalist style as I could make. So it's not I'm not a technical guy. I'm not a developer. It's written in a way that I would sort of write it for my kids, my, my homeschoolers or my high schoolers or whatever. And what I tried to distill it down to was, okay, Bitcoin is great. It can do all of these things. There's no end to it. But what are what are my takeaways? If I'm really going to boil down all my reading to sort of takeaways, what can this thing do that's never been done before? And so I identified these three things that I think Bitcoin does that's just never been done before. One of them is a decentralized network, a completely autonomous, permissionless, decentralized network. And I don't think human beings have ever done that before. Not certainly with the success of Bitcoin. And some people could say, well, some of these other server sharer programs kind of do they're nowhere close to the computing power that Bitcoin and the success of Bitcoin has shown. So for the first time, we've got this decentralized autonomous network. Also, for the first time, we've come across something that has an absolutely finite supply. And we're going to find out in economics what mm -hmm. uh, inelastic supply curve really means. I think we're finding that out right now. I think we're just we're just uh, getting started to find out. Uh, it's, April it's is going, going to be very shocking for some that are uh, yeah that, that don't <laughs> yeah I so i challenge yeah. anybody tell me something that has an absolutely finite supply anything like they they don't exist outside of somebody could say well the mona lisa okay agreed mm -hmm. but the mona lisa is a one item it's a collectible and it can't be shared by a bunch of people so i'm talking it's about not, like yeah, big picture things. yeah it's not exactly divisible <laughs> Right. Yeah, exactly. So it's not really uh, a finite supply of something that's going to benefit a lot of people. Uh, you know, gold, we're going to find gold on asteroids. You're never going to run out of gold. Um, I, I can't think of anything in the physical world that actually has a finite supply. So it has to be digital. And this is the first time we've done that. And to me, that's that's really innovative and cool. And who knows where it's going to go. So we've got an autonomous network, we've got a finite supply, and we've also lastly got an immutable ledger. And this this has never been done before. We've been trying some of the earliest writings of mankind or carvings on clay tablets and, and their ledgers, the earliest examples of ledgers that we have. They're just, they are records of what people want to remember. And for the first time, we've got one that can't really be destroyed because it's distributed along that autonomous network to mm -hmm. such a degree that it's pretty much immutable by its um, protocols and it's pretty much indestructible because of how it's dispersed and to me again that's the first time we've had anything like that as human beings so the combination of these three things together in one platform is to me just a little bit mind-blowing mm -hmm. and I don't know what it's going to do or where it's going to go it's kind of like one of my slides in my deck is like ben franklin with the glass jar and the kite he didn't know that voyager one and two were going to be outside of our solar system using the electricity that he had just sort of mm -hmm. discovered who knows where it's going to go right it's it, it is pretty amazing i i do i do like the long-term perspective on things in the in the book Bitcoin realm, we get into Austrian economics and low time preference. And I just, it's just so much to try to communicate. And it's, if the, I didn't have those understandings when we were bringing the kids up. So now I'm trying to do it after. And I'm trying to be cognizant that a lot of people who are listening to this might be on the early stages and trying to figure out how to teach their kids now about how does money really work and why the things you just went through are a big deal. It's just a long-term thing. If it takes if it takes years to get through, and it takes multiple events or different sources for the kids to get it, that's fine. And if they get it from somebody else and not me, if they just get it, that's all I care about. And I think right. every every little bit helps. So some people it might be a book, yep. some a podcast, a game, a course. It might yep. be a life experience, like you you got rugged on something. It all it all comes to it all comes to together. So. Yeah, in, in my mind, we have to start with sort of the, the simplest and most basic concepts because we have over centuries constructed a very complex system here that, that sort of kind of works, but also breaks all the time and we sort of try to fix it. Mm -hmm. um, 
but the you know even the, the basic idea like when you go down and you deposit your paycheck at the bank they don't, they don't put that money in a box with your name on it somewhere in the back room Mm-mm. and wait for you to come back and, and ask for it like that's not that's not the way it works <laughs> that's no. not how no that's not... <laughs> all right so um, listen let's let's do this what your bitcoin resume is is pretty long you talked about your you're helping with the the meetup group you have the book you're doing the money camp you you're doing a lot of, of things. Do we miss anything big that we should tell everybody about? No, I mean, I'm, I, I really like to gain more traction with uh, the lectures. The, the, the money camp is more of a kid's thing that has been a little bit sidelined because they grew up in, and so mm-hmm. I need to sort of self promote again in the community, but it's really the lecturing, um, and I'm not a very good marketer for myself. Right. So it's, it's getting, it's just helping to get the word out and being willing to be the guy like i love the antonopolis videos from 2012 when he's in an empty classroom oh yeah i saw i know (laughs) i'll have to go find the link for that for the show notes uh if if anybody hasn't seen what brooke is talking about here here's this monumental thing for humankind and you got one of the one of the people who can explain it best early on telling people about it and there's three people in the audience that probably could hold 200 right. or something and it just you're like oh my god um i'll get a, i'll right. go i'll find that link and, and and share it with folks and tolly and i will be happy to help in any way we can with anybody that we've met that we can introduce you to i have some ideas on maybe we can brainstorm on some of the different things like homeschooling conventions types of things the bitcoin network yeah. is really it's almost like the free and open source mentality they 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 think about the long term and they you you might be a competitor with someone because you're both doing a code but at the end of the day everybody's better off if there are multiple wallets or something like that it's like restaurant row right if if you and I have competing restaurants but we all like are on the same the the same street collectively more people are going to come because they have they have the options so the there's a lot of people in the bitcoin space that are also trying to do education that would probably Maybe they have a leg up on the marketing and can help you. And so if anybody yeah. fits into that bucket, reach out. We're going to have, we'll have Brooks contacts in the, in the show notes here. So you can, let's help each other out. Cause in the end, the long term, we're all better off with this thing. We all, right? we all win eventually. Right? So the last question that, I, that I'll, I think we should wrap up with today is, do you have any favorite, other than those we've already mentioned, do you have any favorite resources that you would recommend to say uh, a family that was just starting out or early on their journey with with the schooling and development of their kids like what are your i guess it could just be a bitcoin reference too if you if you prefer but well if you had one or two or you know your top two or three max recommendations that you would make to someone what would they be well on the homeschooling front i i would say that you know it's, it's a very local thing also so to, to really reach out to your peer groups. They're out there, the people who really are supportive of, of homeschooling. And it, it's absolutely an American thing, true mm-hmm. and through. And that's how, you know, that's how we got through our pioneering years. So to insinuate anything other is, is really not being aware of what our history is. And so I would say seek out these groups, be it through churches or be it through schools or be it through whoever. They're out there and they're very supportive, just like the Bitcoin community. There's a range of views, but everybody's in it kind of together and mm-hmm. you know, we all want our children to succeed that's sort of the number one goal as soon as you kind of have them you realize you want them to have a better life than than, than you did that's that's sort of your goal so find like-minded individuals no matter how small your community is and lean on them because it, it does it is a group effort with regard to the bitcoin side of things you mentioned it earlier how fantastic the internet is for connecting and I, i'm a real fan of youtube just because you can find anything you want I mean, the names that i would throw out to search for obviously michael saylor lynn alden the swan swan is actually headquartered down the road from me i've had the opportunity to meet with Corey a couple of times because nice. we drive past their headquarters he's a super smart guy and he's really personable so swan bitcoin has a lot of educational stuff a lot of mm-hmm. really really well versed and educated people speaking on its behalf and and the same thing with bitcoin holds true is that i don't i don't see eye to eye ideologically with a lot of bitcoiners i'm not nearly the libertarian as many are i i I would say i'm probably more on the progressive sort of liberal side socially but um you know we're all in it together 
We're shooting for the same goals, which is better, mm -hmm. better money systems, better world, better, more fairness. And so just like in homeschooling, there's a lot of dovetailing between these two movements. Well, we appreciate your time today. Tali and I are looking forward to continuing to get to know you better. And hopefully we can meet you in, in person soon and we can talk about these things for hours. So with that, everybody, we'll wrap up this week and we'll catch you next week. Perspective homeschoolers, just do it. Yeah, just do it. All right, I'll keep that in there. <laughs>